Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the book show. I'm so grateful to be doing this again, as I haven't done for a while. And today, I'm going to be interviewing Alison DeMarco with her book, The Citizen Cut. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the book show. So good to be here. I haven't done a book show for a long time. And welcome to Moving On TV. Today, I'm going to be interviewing Alison DeMarco about her book, The Signature from Tibet, um, which is a spectacular, heartwarming, spiritual journey from the highlands of Scotland to Tibet. Um, and it delivers a view on spiritual life coincidence, things like love, death, dying, and reincarnation. <laughs> so here we have all the way from Scotland, um, and uh, all here on to Moving On TV, in our studio here in High Wycombe, <laughs> on Zoom, the lovely Alison DeMarco. So hi Alison, how are you today? So hi Alison, it's so wonderful to see you here today. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good, thank you. Really, really good. Fantastic. And so you're in Scotland uh, because it, it was kind of like all the way from Scotland to, to Tibet, from the signature of Tibet, which is the book we're going to be interviewing, I'm going to be interviewing you about today. So you're in Scotland at the moment? Or? Yeah, I've um, lived in Scotland. I, I lived in London for a while, it, actually Cyprus as well. Um, and yes, I'm in Scotland. Okay, what part of Scotland? I'm in Edinburgh at the moment. Uh, oh, wow. I know. It's... A lot of affinity. I did the Edinburgh Fringe. I sold out at the Piaf. Wow, did you? I did, yeah. You thought you looked me up. <laughs> <laughs> that was 2014 when we started moving on TV. A lot has happened, but that's, it's not my story. That's my story. Um, <laughs> we're talking about your book today. Um, so we're going to be talking about the signature from Tibet. Mm -hmm. Before we go into the book, I want to find out a little bit about Alison. So if you don't mind going back to the beginning and telling us a little bit about your childhood, and of course, because all these influences from your childhood and where you started are all probably going to contribute to what you're writing anyway, and why you got to a level of, of writing that book, so if you could start in the beginning, that, that would be really nice. Sure. Um, you. Well, you know, my, my mother, I was actually adopted. And um, from that adoption, my adopted mother committed suicide. And then my father remarried a woman whom, you know, we didn't, I didn't get on with. And she's tried to separate me from my father, kind of bully me. It was a whole string of dramas that, you know came about but in fact you know when I look back on it she was I used to call her a witch and I think in part it was it was she played mind games and it in turn I had to play mind games back but I was actually really intuitive and and in an inquisitive child and I used to ask questions about everything why this why that and I used to see colors around everything and that was the way I was and but people you know, called me either bad or the wild child or couldn't be controlled or, and eventually, you know, through different things and, and the things that happened to me in my childhood, um, I became anorexic. And from there, I, I actually had an awareness that, that that was what was wrong with me. And it was my boss who pointed it out. And so I managed to get myself through that. Um, it, it was just a topic that you didn't hear much about in those days. And then from there, I just left home and began to drink, you know, took marijuana and everything was just wonderful. And anything that had happened to me became almost like a party story, you know, bit of a laugh here, bit of a laugh, uh, when none of it was funny whatsoever. And, um, but it was my coping mechanism. And eventually, I left home as soon as I could and eventually ended up in a place called St Andrews and then down to, to London. And I realised I could invent myself because nobody knew me. I could create a character. And 
and I guess I did. Um, and from there, eventually I came home. I'll cut a long story short. There's lots of bits in between. But I always had this knowing about people's health or their emotional states. And of course, I would say it, then I'd be in trouble. But at this point in time, I knew my, my father was very ill. Um, in that period of time, I found my adopted mother and my family and realized I had brothers and sisters and met them. But I wanted to meet my father. Uh, my mother had told me he was an alcoholic, an, an old bidder, a waste of time, and never worked. And it, eventually, I found him, and she fell out with me because of that. So, or I fell out with her. There was a whole, another story attached to that. And um, I found my father had been and was a head chef, a musician, and we were so alike. In fact, my daughter was like, oh no, there's two of you now. <laughs> so, um, my mother emigrated to Canada. And in this process, I knew my dad was ill. And I, I knew, I just knew. And um, he died. I was I, because I was at a funeral, um, my mother suddenly announced that my father was in hospital. And I just went, and she said, you've got no right. I said, what, every right? I said, he's going to die. And so she was like, yes, as usual, exaggerating. And you, what, what do you know? Nothing. But anyway, I got up to the hospital and managed to see him before he went to the operation. And he, did, he died that day. And I told my mother, I warned my mother, but so that was another, all these things, there was a, my son nearly died. So all these beliefs that if I loved someone, they would die, were acting out almost in front of me. And I had no idea really how to be a mother and eventually hospitalized uh, with a, or nobody knew what was wrong with me, but the doctor said I had food poisoning. And I just knew, I, you, you know, you've got to give me something to calm me down, I'm off my head, I'm absolutely flying. And eventually uh, a nurse, she said, what happens, Alison? Because my daughter had come in and she, had, my daughter was only five and she wrote me a note and it, and it read, mommy, please come home, we love you. Do you know, and of course the tears came, the floodgates opened and a nurse said to me, right, what happens when a waste paper basket fills? And I thought she was equally as mad as what I was. And, but I, I said, well, it, well, it overflows. And she said, think about it. So I signed myself out of the hospital and again, had to claw my way back. I had a spiritual experience where I went in this tunnel and this voice said to me, well, do you want to live or die? Because I'd been sitting, sitting in a chair for six months in silence. But I'd never considered that I was going to die. I just wanted to sit there because I couldn't do anything else. And um, I said, well, I want to live. And I did. And I started. And from that uh, journey, I then found this uh, a complimentary practitioner. And um, she was an aromatherapist and various different things. And when I went to her, it was a miracle. And she said, um, so, you know, tell me a bit about your childhood. And the more I, I talked, she, she was like, no wonder you're in this state. And that was the first sort of recognition. And then I went to a hypnotherapist, but it just, my whole world opened up because I found, found color. And, you know, being dyslexic and having very low self-esteem, I, I found color and I found the language and I trained with the late Vicky Wall and my life just, became this amazing journey of learning and miracles and and new skills and abilities that and also almost what happened was I found I the I am I was born as not the one that you know people had put all their beliefs and conditioning and and, and everything on I found me and wow did I find peace thank you it, it's so amazing how our all our stories are so similar we yeah. all get stripped down to practically nothing and that's what you know again i don't talk too much about myself because it's your book and your story today but the synchronicities between our spiritual healers or those of us that are doing the work 
like you get stripped down to nothing everything leaves you whether with me it was family that cut me off and mental breakdowns and not being able to get anywhere and feeling different and like you say you you meet those people that suddenly say to you you're okay you, you, yeah it's okay after you've been brought up to believe that everything about you is wrong absolutely it's fascinating so so basically this all happened to you and uh, and so how how did you get to tibet from scotland i mean that's a big it's a big well and it, you know it must have taken a while for you to grow to get to that level how did that happen it, it well it is fascinating i mean i just do have to add that when i was 13 i had a, a visitation from this um apparition who told me he had come in the image of jesus and for that i've held all my life and it saved me through you know whatever i've gone through plus two lots of breast cancer that are that and those stories are miracles within themselves it's, it's almost like i've had this this hand beside me guiding me and and i'm sure most people do but it's been only more on reflection you begin to really think about wow how amazing and um so how i got to well it was a strange day one i woke up one saturday morning and i thought oh i think i'll go and get a new fridge but somehow i i can't tell you how i ended up outside our edinburgh property center right and it was a saturday a busy day you can't get parked oh there a car pulled out and into the center i went i didn't know why i was going into the center didn't want to move house and um anyway i was led to i think it was something like the sixth row down and so many pictures in and then i saw this beautiful house and thought gotta buy it and uh, that in itself was the process because i got stitched up by my lawyers on all many things and i ended up going back to this lady who had helped me uh, her name was bridget um get over you know my depression and everything else and i said I, i'm gonna lose this house my lawyer's not got me a mortgage and immediately she said you'll get your mortgage i'm hearing you'll get it through the allied irish bank this house for you you will get this who do you know well cut a long story short uh, i knew someone 10 years prior and i managed to contact them within minutes it, it, it all fell into place within an hour he had come out to see me and got me my mortgage and it, in those days, it was a very a large amount of money. It was something like 130,000 or maybe more, 130. And I couldn't sell my house and I prayed to God. Then my ex-husband one day said, I'm going to buy your house, I'll help you out. I mean, it was like miracle upon miracle. So one day in this new property that was ramshackle, it was in the countryside, the opposite of how I had been living with my kids. It was just, but I used to say to the kids, look at the beautiful sunrises. You know, we may not have hot water, Mark. Anyway, um, <laughs> one day this lady turned, literally turned up at my door and I was gardening saying, and I, again, I was saying to God, oh, you know, I can't cope with this and I, I don't know where I'm going and I don't know, I've got so much on my shoulders to get this place into what I wanted was a healing centre. What it, firstly, a house that we could live in properly. And um, so this lady arrived and banged on my door and, um, I, you know, I said, yes. And she went, I've come to see you. Um, I know that you've, you've to come down to Sammy Ling with me. I'm like, who is this woman? And, I, and she's like, oh, so, and do you have herbal, herbal tea? Oh, I said, do come in. <laughs> anyway, so she <laughs> sat down and cutting another long story short, she said, we're going down to Sammy Ling next week to see um, Dr. Akon Toku Rinpoche. So I'm, yeah, okay, who's he? What's, what's that? What's Sami Ling? And she said, it's a Buddhist centre, the first in the West. Oh, Buddhist. Oh, okay, well, we'll go down. Now, that was the first part of the journey. And on that journey, we were maybe less than a mile from Sami Ling. In this kamikaze crow flew into, I, I, I said to Joan, why is the bird flying at us and then it hit the window screen so she slammed on the brakes picked the bird up oh clearly it was dying and she put it in the back of the car and i'm and she said you sit in the back of the car with it mm. anyway we, we we got to sammy ling and um 
And I was looking up this up today, um, and it was actually in 1994. That date is very significant, and I'll tell you why later. I only found that out today. So we, so I ran into the office and I screamed at the first available monk. And I mean, it's very quiet there and very calm. And, you know, I said, we, we've got a crow, we've got a crow, it's, it's, it's dying, it's in the back of the car. Well, he thought, I said, we've got a body. Again, that's significant. Oh my God. He came out and he said, it is a crow. I said, well, exactly. So he said, Look, I'll take it to Aquan Rinpoche to decide its fate. In those days, I'm saying in those days, and I don't believe in animal cruelty, I, I just wanted to put the bird out of its pain. So I said, well, why don't you just like kill it? it it's in pain. And <laughs> I don't think he could believe what he was hearing. So the bird went to Akon Rinpoche, but we had a meeting with Akon Rinpoche. And the thing is, the nearer the meeting got, he, and he's the founder of Sami Ling, um, the, the more hysterical I felt. And I, I just, all I could think of was this sort of, you know, high llama sitting with a dying bird on his desk that we basically killed or, you know, was responsible for. And we went in and cutting a long story short, thank goodness, the, the bird had gone over to a nun to, to, to have its last few hours with this nun. Well, um, within 10 minutes, uh, Akon Rinpoche said, I will be the overseer to your project, which was the healing center, and I grant your Dharma center. Right. Oh, so he was going to help you realize your dream, just like that. Just like that. Just like that. I wasn't a Buddhist. I mean, I was just like, oh. oh. <gasps> so we went over to the coffee shop where you know, we met this monk we had met before going in, who had taken the crow, and he said, you know, how did you get on? I said, well, it was a bit bizarre. I said, you know, he offered to be my overseer and granted me a Dharma center. And he was like, a dar why would you do that? I got a Dharma center. I said, yeah, I said, what is a Dharma center? <laughs> so don't well, it's, it's a spiritual healing center. And I said, well, maybe he'll change his mind. Wait, the monk straight to his rosary beads. Akon changed his mind. No, he wouldn't say this. All right. And it, that began a huge process for me of going up and down with plans. And he didn't even read them. You know, I would go in and he would look at the front cover, flick it over, two second note, take them back. So this went on. And so this raised so many questions like, what is he doing? What is this about? Anyway. So Eventually, I told my uncle the story. Now, this is where this all becomes very incredibly strange. So I tell my uncle the story. My uncle was a, a dentist in Edinburgh. And um, he said to me, oh, he said, many years back, he said, a delegation came from, he said, I can't remember where it was. I think it was Tibet. Um, one of them had toothache. He says, but I've never seen anything like it. You know, there was an order I had to do things. Um, the, the, he had all the, this entourage with him. And he told me a really funny story that the, the, um, the limousine was parked outside the dental surgery and the traffic warden came in and said to, the, um, to my uncle's secretary, that car out there, move it. And so my uncle's secretary said, Oh, he's, you know, he's diplomatic immunity, I think. He's, anyway, he's a high llama from Tibet. And traffic warden said, I don't care if it's a Pope, move the car. And it, in that time, my uncle treated the dentist for the, who was, or who, yeah, who was, His Holiness, the 16th Kamapa, who is the uh, overall um, teacher of the Kagyu lineage of Buddhist teachings. And wow. Ling is Kagyu lineage, and the 16th Kamapa was the overseer to Akon Rinpoche and the building of Sami Ling. So these are now we're making a few connections here. So to stop you there. Oh, cool. So my so then my uncle says to me, um, "Do you know what?" He said, "I've got his tour program." He said, "You know, you can have it." So he gave me His Holiness the 17th the 16th Kamapa's tour program. And 
I just had it lying around for a while and, and eventually I thought, you know what, I've got no more plans for Acon. I've got no more plans. I'm going mad. There are no more plans. I'll take the programme down. So I took the programme down and, you know, Acon, he, he's a very, he was, he was a very quietly spoken man. And he was, every time I went in, the energy was oh, absolutely incredible. It was, for me, it was almost like everything in the room disappeared and all that was left was Akon. And uh, incredible. Anyway, so this time I said, I said, well, would you like to see this? I've got no more plans. Because by now I'm actually really friendly with Akon, but I'm not a Buddhist, so I'm not quite as, you know, I'm just more natural. But he was a very natural man. I mean, amazing, amazing person. So um, I showed him the program. And, for the, and actually, my friend heard him at the other end of the corridor. Well, I nearly fell off my seat. And, and he's, he demanded to know how I got the programme, where I got the programme, and if I knew what was written on it, and who the person in the picture was. And of course, all of that, I, I had no clue. I said, well, I'm really, no, I said, I have no idea. I didn't even know that was writing. It, it's just squiggles. And he said, it's Tibetan writing. It's a message to your uncle from His Holiness in his own writing, uh, the 16th Kamapa, and he signed it and dated it. And he said, this is a very rare relic to the Buddhist community, uh, the Buddhist Sangha, which is a Buddhist community. So, yeah, so that was, so that was in 74. Joan arrives at my door in 94. And really from then, a huge journey opened up because I ended up, Finishing, you know, I stopped going down to Akron because there's no more plans. I went, lived in Cyprus for two years. And then almost the moment I came back, a friend, you know, called me and said, oh, you're back. And, blah, blah. and I met Akron Rinpoche the other day. He, he tells me he's got unfinished business with you. Oh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> so I phoned up, got an appointment with him and um, went down to Samiling. And now that started another journey up and down, up and down. Why have I got the signature? What am I doing with the signature? And every time, you know, he just wouldn't, doesn't answer. You're meant to work it out yourself. So eventually I asked him the right question, which was, um, what should I do with it? What's the significance of it? Yeah, I just don't know. And, and, and so can you tell me what the significance of this signature is? And he answered. He said, no. <laughs> he said, um, I want you now to go to India and meet with His Holiness, the 17th Kamapa. Yeah. Sorry, Alice. Yeah, something I wanted to take you back to very quickly of, of what you said. It felt in a way that you, that something put you just in the right place with the right people that your uncle had already been connected. And then there was you. And can you go back a minute to the significance of the crow? Because isn't the crow a lot to do with death? Isn't there a symbolism of death in some way? Can you go back to that? Why did you think that happened? That that crow actually died in front of you or nearly died in front of you? Is there a, a significance there? Are you leading to it? <laughs> I think you're an incredible interviewer. <laughs> and I think you're very, and I think you're very, very intuitive, right? I, I, I do tend to know what's coming next. I've had, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's so, it's amazing when you meet like-minded people who, who think, you know, who are awake because so many people I tell the story to, they totally miss the crow. No, and the crow is very important. And they only yeah. Crow, but what resonates with me, which will with a lot of people, is my massive recovery because I was, I was um, diagnosed with serious borderline personality disorder, which I don't believe in. It's post-traumatic stress. But the, I had been studying A Course in Miracles for years, and the psychiatrist that saw me knew I wouldn't take medication, so she offered me um, um, an alternative therapeutic community where you don't use medication and that was it. That's how I had my massive awakening. So everything was constructed, everything led, led, led to it. And I can see it, but anyway, let's get back to you, Alison. So okay. about the crow. <laughs> well, I, I think, honestly, I do think it's amazing to, to pick up on that because I would say 
percent of people will not pick up on that. And so the question that you asked me is the answer or one of the answers of this journey. And I didn't find out anything about the crow and I'm now going on a different direction until many years later when I began to write the book. And again, that's another story, but the crow. And yes, why did Akon Rinpoche give, say he'd be the overseer and grant me a Dunbar Centre, all about the crow? In my opinion, this is my opinion, this is not Akon's. I never asked him. When I was researching many, many years later, um, sort of almost two thirds of the way through the book, I kept thinking, what's the crow? There has to be a significance of this crow because I've begun to write about the crow again. And um, I, I researched it. Now, the, firstly, oh, for a long time, I had the word Dracard in my head, Dracard. So when my son was born, I said to my husband, I want him to be called Dracard. And my husband's like, no chance. No mm -hmm. chance. So we, we ended up, we called him Daryl. So I thought, right, well, I'll just, I'll, the house in the country, I'm going to call it Drakkar. So this Drakkar had lived with me for a long time, the name. So the crow, I researched the crow, and the, they, the Buddhists believe it's a reincarnate lama who is giving a message or alerting. And because the main deity, Milarepa, is represented by the crow. Now, many years later, when I, again, I was still researching, this book took 10 years. I was still looking at different things at different points that I wanted to know. It didn't all come at once. And Milarepa, um, his uh, retreat where he spent, he was, a, Milarepa apparently, and I might, I hope I get this all right, is the first enlightened being in a lifetime. And he would meditate in a cave. And he and the cave was called Drakkar. So, you know, there's all these interwoven little mm -hmm. snippets in that really didn't come to light to much, much later. Now, my son, when he was 13, well, I won't go into the story, but suffice to say, he decided he was going to become a hermit. He was going to live in the highlands of Scotland and he was going to write music and poetry just as Milarepa did. Oh. However, my son doesn't want, he's not going to wear any of that. <laughs> Even when I told him I was going to call him the car. <laughs> no. So. Okay. Um, Can I take yeah. back again to the crow? Because my intuition is working here. Okay. Um, in the book, you talk about dying. You talk about the, 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 the whole thing is a lot about dying and reincarnation. Now, you had a big, you said in the beginning that one of your biggest fears were loss, that everyone you loved would die. So is that what one of your journeys was? Do we have to confront that big issue in order to go out there, in order to have this awakening so that we can actually tell the human race you know what we what they don't know so we can enlighten them in some way because that kind of resonates with me with what you were saying before uh yes i'm i'm saying yes and i think what happened was for a long time a lot i didn't lose my faith i never lost my faith i just didn't really acknowledge it and i think coming sort of almost full circle and then coming to the buddhists and coming to a, a space where you learn, you, you begin to understand life, you wake up and then you, you look at these things instead of a, in a sleep state. And you, you do it because you're consciously aware of your thinking. So when I was asleep, I would fear death because A, I didn't have the information, I didn't have the knowledge. I was running patterns. Everybody around me and beliefs that I loved had died, including you know, my um, adopted mother, etc. So I had all these beliefs, but I think, you know, when I came back and I found um, this, I really did wake up and I found spirituality again. Then I found the way I look at it is Jesus and I found God. And I, but I also learned the spiritual side 
to, to a degree of Buddhism. Didn't become a Buddhist because I, I, I like to say I'm non-denominational. But I think when you have this knowledge, it's, it's knowledge that we lack that causes fear. And it's our thinking. When we can control our thinking, which is, you know, that chatterbox, it just goes on and on and on and on. Then when we can control that or understand it or, or be able to stop it, just to give us a little rest, I have, and I came to that point of the faith that there is life after death in me and that what I also know is that the researchers have found that at, at this moment of conception, there's a spark of light. And many, many people who have passed over have to, you know, have come back, have said they saw the light. And we know the Bible says in the beginning there was light. So light surrounds us and we are light. We have an electromagnetic field. And the more light we are, then the more able to understand that that's where we'll return to. Mm. It's almost like when I do my readings, I, I get messages from people who've passed on that I couldn't, I couldn't possibly know. So there is um, this energy, this is all, it's waves and waves of different vibrations of energy and we can tap into them. So you see, I didn't know when I interviewed you that we were going to get into, I'd say, the biggest reason that people have gone into such panic and fear is the fear of death. I think it's the biggest fear there is. And if we were born to embrace it, and I was thinking about when I did my talk before about how they shoot Bambi's mother. In ba when you're a child, you go to see a film and the first thing yeah. you they show you death and violence, but they don't explain it to you that, you know, she doesn't come back as an angel. She doesn't come back as something positive. It's a shock to a tiny child. And that's how we're brought up. I wasn't allowed to even talk about death because there was so much in my mother's life that it was banned. The word death and the word shit <laughs> were two things yeah. that we were not allowed to talk about or even say in the house. So when I decided to do this interview with you, I never realized that this was actually going to be touching on, I'd say, the main reason that the world has gone mad is the fear of death. It takes you right back. It's such a helplessness because we don't know. So what I'm interested in is in the book where, where you talk about this, can you talk a little bit about what's in the book about dying and reincarnation, and all the issues that people just don't know. I mean, you get people that say they've had experiences and they know, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen to me. I, I, I think I, I've experienced things and I'd like to think that I would move on in a positive way or I don't know, maybe I'd come back again and experience the chaos, which I really don't want to go to another planet, ideally. <laughs> But no, coming back to what I really want to ask is, how can you explain it? What do you want to say about that? What experiences did you have that may be able to help a lot of people that are in so much fear? I'm not scared of dying for standing up for humanity anymore. I've gone past that now. And I think a lot of people have because we, you know, it's just, it's obvious now. But a lot of people are so scared of losing their lives that they would rather be stuck and believe what they're told than to even take a glimpse into what that light is. So what is death? What is death? In, in, in layman terms, what do you feel your experiences of that truth? What is it? Well, I think for me, it's, it's a huge subject and it's not one I would say that is easy explained. But I, from my point of view, I, I have to say, I mean, I've nearly died quite a few times, um, twice with cancer. But I, so I think you have, for the, it, when you're in that situation, you do have to wake up and you, you almost feel it in the moment. And then I came to a realization, almost that it, to trust the process. And as it was, I, I, miracles happened on that journey. But your question about death, I've come to understand in, it's almost like my faith. So firstly, I've got my faith. 
and I believe in I believe in God in the energy. And the second thing is, with these scientists having found a link, a spark of light at conception, we know scientifically that light contains all information. We also know that we're we're brought up not as the person that we truly are, because we 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 take on board other people's behaviours, beliefs, conditioning. So if we can get ourselves back to who we truly are and find our purpose, know our personality, know everything about us and find our purpose and look out to, you know, stand up to help other people. My mission is to help the Tibetan people after the Chinese uh, invasion. And again, a very delicate subject. So for me, it's my belief in God and that spark of light in the beginning and the spark of light when we pass over. Now, the way what I do is I do this sort of breathing technique, and it, it actually brings your mind into your body. Now, that's a, it's a strange thing for me because we go around just really expecting our body and knowing that our body does everything for us. But when we really become, get, but, but when we stop the thinking, and we get into the mind, not the thinking, we get into the mind that's within the body, we feel our body as um, almost a light energy. Now, we know that when we pass over, the body dies, the heart stops, there is no more functioning. So it, I think you have to look at your beliefs to say, so where does the mind go? Because we know all these, um, highly trained lamas uh, and uh, other guru figures can take their mind out of their body. They can move, they can, they can separate from their body. They can look down on the body. People who have passed over and come back, look down on their body. So we have to then look at it through our own beliefs and, and, and learn and see what does happen or what possibilities do happen. And so I think for me, my belief is, is we come in with a spark of light, we go out with that spark of light. And within that spark of light, it's unique to us in this lifetime. And it holds all the energy, vibration, information, and knowledge that we've, we've gone through in this lifetime and in others. Thank you. Okay. Um, so coming back to the signature from Tibet, why the name? What does the name mean? What's this, what does it signify? What's the symbol? Where did you get uh, it? Well, um, the, 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 now, the, His Holiness the 16th Kamapa, he was known uh, and uh, was seen to perform miracles. This, this is a very highly revered um, Lama who very much like, you know, the, the, there is a Daila Lama, but His Holiness the 16th Kamapa, he's the 16th because he's reincarnated. From the 15th so this lineage has got all the teachings um high teachings i mean uh, you know, uh, teachings that would be beyond my comprehension um of of the mind etc and um he was the teacher to akon rinpoche in tibet and um so there's another link and um and akon rinpoche escaped tibet um, over the Himalayas through through the, these horrendous con conditions, 300 of them, he was in a party of 300 and only 13 made it. And I believe, I'm saying the right thing, that they were the high lamas that had trained their minds to survive with no food through the minus whatever 30, 40, 50 conditions and also pursued by the Chinese. So, um, uh, so when he came to Scotland, is now my belief, he left his signature for a purpose. This is all planned. They can see the future. They, they're in, these people, are, I, I've had experience, I'm talking from experience. They are absolutely incredible people. And um, when you say he left the signature, can you explain what you mean by that? Yes, so he sat, when he went to my uncle, out of all the dentists in Edinburgh, he, he could have gone to, the, he he went to he was the, he chose my uncle, right from 
possibly a list of a few people that were given from the embassy. It, he had too thick, you know. He came here. I believe on on the seventy four tour. Um, I believe he knew he was leaving his signature. Now I also believe I I've, I've got a feeling. I think I'm right in saying that they used to have like a stamp, a seal, or um, uh, but anyway, he he personally signed and wrote in his own handwriting a message of thanks to my uncle and signed and dated it. Therefore, he's saying, I'm leaving my signature here. Okay. Why did he do it? Uh, well, you know, but we know also two things I know as well is that the Chinese invaded. They destroyed a lot of his signatures, a lot of his paperwork. We also know that there is um, the Kamapa controversy, which was that the Chinese put in another Kamapa as the 17th. So when the 16th Kamapa died, it, in fact, it was Akon Rinpoche was one of the people who had to go and find this young boy who was the reincarnation of the 16th Kamapa. Wow. And there's a very interesting story that I did read in a book, so I'm just repeating it. Um, and uh, that um, Akon Rinpoche had asked the 16th Kamapa, how am I going to recognize you? And the 16th Kamapa had said that he would give him a, a tooth. Oh, right. That would be between those two. It is recorded in a book. And um, when Akon Rinpoche did eventually meet with him, the little boy gave him a tooth. And that's why he recognized this, or not, that's not why, he recognized the 17th Kamapa based on information that he had that the 16th Kamapa had left. Mm. There's a court case because the Chinese um, put in their own Kamapa. So there is now two Kamapas who live in India. Now, this is, so here we come in, I now have a signature and, and a handwritten message um, in His Holiness the 16th Kamapa's handwriting and Akon Rinpoche tells me to take it to the 17th Kamapa. So when, again, I'm not really thinking too much about this or, or, or why, I just decide to go. By a miracle, my son decides to come, which is very unusual for him to want to have traveled anywhere with me. But we go, and we, this is fascinating because we go to, um, uh, we go to, to visit His Holiness in, you know, um, where he is at his monastery. And uh, there's armed guards. And you know, my son, whether it was from the airplane that looked like it was polyfillered up, it was Buddha air actually, and from you know the kamikaze, the drivers, it was just my son kept saying, We're gonna die, we're gonna die. And I kept saying, Well, that's part of it, it's fine, we're totally fine, don't worry about it. So when he saw the armed guards, he's like, That this is it. So I just walked up to them and I said, um, I I've got a very important document to show his holiness the 17th Kamapa. Um, Dr. Akon Tukur Rinpoche sent me. So eventually, um, they sent down the secretary to His Holiness, who's, who said, well, you can show me the, the document. I says, no, I can't. It's only to show His Holiness the 17. He said, well, you, three weeks. I said, no, 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 no. I said, no, no, no. I said, I'm returning to Scotland in two days. I need to see him tomorrow. And so he wrote it in his book. So he said, right, come back here at 11. So my son, we, we left and we, we went back the next day and the armed guards, we don't recognize you. You don't have an appointment. You're not all, I said, don't even go there. No, no, I said, I'm here on a mission. I, I said, where's the secretary? I need to see the secretary, blah, blah, blah. And um, anyway, we got to see his holiness, the 17th come up and that all oh my, I, I just never experienced anything like this. The energy was, uh, and he was sitting and, and I don't really know the Buddhist protocol, but I thought you were meant to be lower than him, but he was sitting really low. So, and um, he's with us and, and uh, I think an interpreter and, uh, and his energy is beyond, and I thought, well, I'm going to start laughing. So I said, well, look, I said, Dr. Alcum took remember she sent me. I have this, um, tour program of yourself, or oh, well, the 16th, which is what, anyway, would you like to see it? <laughs> and he's like, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had to bring it over uh, and I took it over and then I sat back down and um, he turned to the interpreter, he stares at the programme because in theory that should be his signature. That should have, he should recognise this. So, then he, so he, then he said to me, please tell me the story. Oh, okay. So I told him the story and then and I said to him, look, Obviously, if this is a rare relic to the Buddhist Sangha, what should I do with it? And he said, you put it in a book for the world to see. I was like, wow, wow. Oh, wow, really? But we came out of there. And what was interesting was, um, well, we, we were hysterical. It was so embarrassing. We had to walk down a line of about 100 people who were waiting to see him. We had been in for about 20 minutes. Usually, I think you want to get two or three. And we were hysterical. We'd, son and I, you know, when you get ill and you want to roll around and you just can't breathe. Yeah. It was, oh, so, so that it's when we got to the airport, there were two monks there and they said, so, you know, we're interested. How did you get so long? I did it. So I said, oh, because I've got this, this program. Oh, I see it. So I brought it out and one of them was crying. You know, there were, it, it was an incredible journey and um, just meant to be. So, I mean, the question that comes up here is why do people's lives not always go like that? I mean, why do people not get directed and guided in that way? What do you think stops them? What holds them back? Well, I, I think a lot of people are, with it, not being disrespectful, I think they're asleep because they've become so desensitized because of whether it's our schooling, our, our peers, society, ex you know, to be honest, society expects you to behave in a certain way. And when you don't, you know, they're, they're possibly either going to give you medication or, you know, lock you up or, but so there's not, in, in a lot of, of cases, we, we can develop that. I'm not anybody, well, I wouldn't, don't think I'm any different from anyone else. We're still, we're human beings. We're all the same. But by some reason, I believed, you know, I believed I had a purpose. Um, I, I, I saw this vision that said they had come in the image of Jesus. And I held that with me. And, and I think some people, you know, we, we have got, you've got a purpose. You've found your purpose. And other people ha have as well. And I think for those who haven't, it, start looking wake up because i think we're more we're more awake when we're asleep in our lovely yeah. dreams you know it's really interesting as i'm talking to you you brought up a memory in me i used to be a gutsy little girl when i, I was i was born in ireland and they took me to israel and i'll never forget it um i don't know if you knew moshe dayan moshe dayan was one of the uh, high captains in the army and he had um, an eye patch and I remember as a little girl, I had so much guts. I don't know what happened to me after about the age of 13. A lot, I know what happened to me. I'm not going to go into it, but I was numbed down completely. Yeah. In my teens, completely. But I would go up. I went up to Moshe Dayan. I thought it was Moshe Dayan. I went up to him and I said, are you Moshe Dayan? Just like that, straight to him. Mm -hmm. And we were doing the same with Golda Meir. She was on the same kibbutz as my aunt. No fear whatsoever. Right up there, confronting her, saying, oh, hi, are you Golda? Can I have my picture taken? Or, you know, there was so much courage. And then bit by bit, it was pushed down, pushed down. Pushed yeah. down. And then um, it's all come up. <laughs> it's all come up. And you become, you, now uh, you're in, we're all coming into this space now, this awakening where it's time for people to say, I've had enough. And we can see it happening. And I, I'm very excited about what's happening. I think it's all being constructed. I, I think it's ha that um, it's happened. Actually, the good guys have made it happen for a reason in order to wake up as many people as possible. Like we're seeing this, all lives matter. It's extraordinary. Suddenly people are saying we all matter. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, it's seeing beyond. But anyway, before we finish, because I could go on forever with you. <laughs> so much to talk about. 
Um, what is your favorite part of the book? Um, could you read us maybe a small part of, um, of the book that you really, really enjoyed writing? Or maybe was your favorite part? I think that's, that's quite hard to know, but I will tell you, I will tell you one, the, the, um, I've got the book. So I will tell you that um, it will appeal to a lot. It's of very difficult because it continues a bit. I tell you what I will do. I'll show you this picture. Can, um, can you see that? I'm not sure where I'm meant to put the camera. Can you see it? No, I can't. It's, it's hang on. This is, just let me get to the, um, I just want to get to the very part. Um, I should have got this organized, part two, right? So <laughs> I wrote, so, hold on. I saw, I, so I wrote part, part two, so I wrote part two before I wrote part one. And then and to write part two, because I had wanted to go, well, I decided I was going to Tibet because, to research this book. Akun Rinpoche said, absolutely not, do not go. But of course I didn't listen and I went with my son and the Chinese picked us up in Kathmandu and refused us entry. Told us oh. we were spies, journalists and spies. So oh. I, we didn't get to go. So I had to then write everything that I did about Tibet from my mind. I felt as if I lived in Tibet for, for months and months and months writing, um, writing this. But um, my favorite part that I always found very difficult to, um, to work through, because it begins with a soldier's story in 1850. Now this was in Scotland. So this was the first part prior that I, I wrote second, if you see what I mean. It's the- How does that connect to the story? <laughs> a soldier in- Okay, so, so exactly. So, um, how it connects is that um, there's a soldier, a young boy, who is living in this um, estate in um, uh, in uh, the highlands of Scotland, and um, he doesn't want to be the estate manager. He doesn't want to work for his father. And he, uh, but he, the the local the local girl, um, who uh, is there who he knows he, he has this sort of affair with but he runs she's in love with him you know they're very young but like she's absolutely in love with him and then um, she's just like the the housemaid and um but anyway he runs away not knowing she's pregnant because this this book spans generations of reincarnation and so he this he becomes a soldier and he ends up in Tibet in 1901. Uh, in inverted commas, the peaceful uh, peace treaty of 19, it wasn't a peace treaty, it was a bloodbath. Nothing was. Nothing. You know, all this, whatever, um, is not. So I think, you know, the end part of his story is, um, maybe I should read it. I'm not very good at reading. So do you want me to read it? What, one paragraph? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, it's something that's actually going to um, maybe touch certain people that cannot be touched. And if you okay. reach those people that may not... Maybe well, I maybe need to read a wee bit more. As I say, being dyslexic is never easy. So if I, if I hiccup, I'll just start again. <laughs> You're fine. So it's chapter 11, and it's the first story in the book of four. So... And we're talking about the soldier and he's basically coming from the garden he's coming back in and um, he's going back up to sit in his chair by the fire in this large mansion um, and he sits at his desk i'm skimming because i don't want to read you all the paragraphs i'll be here um but he's got he's got something to do he's got to write this letter okay so he's writing this letter and um, he's had a revelation now He's, he's now, he's understood his life because he, 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 his soul, his soul stayed in Tibet because if he, another story, he fell in love with a Tibetan woman, not too much, but it, she, she, anyway, you have to read it. Anyway, so um, he's, he's written his letter 
and he's now going to sit by his chair. And so this is, I'll have to read a few, okay? This is significant, okay? So the heat from the invigorated fire made him loosen his collar. And as he did so, he felt the, the coral cord round his neck. Now the coral cord um, is significant as well, it's Tibetan. The shaking hand reached up to touch the amulet against his no longer youthful skin. For the first time since putting it on, he lifted the amulet up and over his head. He'd worn it next to his skin since the day it was given to him by the dying Lama in Tibet, and he now held it tightly in his left hand. Decades of time reversed his mind. Just as he glanced down at the amulet and, wonder who, and wondered who had taken it from him and who would take it from him, a tingling sensation moved up his arm. A searing pain then gripped his chest and he saw a grey mist swirl round him and round him that made him feel giddy and slightly sick to his stomach. His ears hurt as if somebody was clashing a pair of large brass cymbals next to his head. He felt and heard his heart racing faster and louder as he became the heartbeat. As he surveyed the, now this is the net, this is the change, okay? So as he surveyed the expanse of his room and all that had kept him company throughout the years, his eyes glimpsed what he thought was a flash of turquoise, indigo and black coming from outside his window, perhaps cast by the light of the moon. For an instant, he wondered if it was possible, but no. It couldn't be. The crow was long dead, lifeless and mounted. It sat glaring out from its glass case in the hall. But I better check to make certain, he thought to himself. And just as this thought occurred to him, he found himself facing the dead bird, looking back at him. Now he was outside, looking up into the branches of the trees that intruded upon his view from the study. What? No crows roosting in the tree this afternoon? Where did they all go, he wondered. Slowly, he crossed the gravel driveway. There was no sound of footsteps. He reached the ornamental pond where the white lilies were picked out, by the fade, picked out by the fading light of the afternoon. And he saw the soft petals stained with streaks of pink and was held in their essence, safe and protected. He wanted to hold the beautiful flower in his hands, yet he found himself encased within its petals as he felt himself traveling faster and faster upwards. It was now the wild lotus flowers that flourished across the foothills of the Himalayas that he wanted more and more than anything to see again. He travelled across the manicured green lawns of Corby's Glen. Stern and reproachful adult voices gave way to the familiar laughter and teasing of the child children of his youth. He traced the path of light from the moon's luster to the grey stone sentinels that guarded Corby's Glen entrance. With no effort, he was now free of them. They drifted past him just as they had that fateful dark night all those years ago. For a brief moment, there is only darkness and fear, soon replaced by shivering of grey stone that seemed to beckon him, a wall of white peak greyness that drew him closer to offer peace. He drifted over the white peaked, the whitened peaks and descended into another green and green, another green, a green that swayed with the wind, the green of the meadows and streams rough hewn by nature, not man. Okay, so there's more. Your, your way of your description of writing. But the, net, the, the final sentence, because you know, obviously he's on a journey, the final sentence is that leads you to part two is a muffled voice then became crystal clear. Me thong dawa go mu. Si dawa, it's a girl. What does that say that again? And I'm, sh and I'm sure you'll pick up on what that <laughs> <laughs> And that takes you into part two, which is into bit. Oh, it's absolutely incredible. It's been amazing talking to you. Um, this book out on Audible because I'm not very good at reading books at the moment. I've got so much to do, but I'm, I would love to be able to listen to this. Me and my husband sometimes we sit and listen to books together. And yeah. I want to get it if it's out on uh, Audible or some kind of audio book. How can people get the book? Okay, so it's on Amazon, the signature from Tibet. It's on my website, uh, www.alisondemarco.com. It's, um, it is, it's available on audio only through me because the file is so big, but we haven't done it on audio. So it's one of those computer voices that uh, it's about 
Um, so it is a huge, huge file, and I'm not technical. So <laughs> yeah. you know, how to get it on audio, or yeah. audible, I think it is. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's on um, Kindle on Amazon, it's on Amazon, and it's, it is available on download from myself if they email me. But how I do that is, is you know, it's, it's a big file. Yeah, 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 it sounds like it. But it's it's absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Before we go, I, um, is there anything that you feel you'd like to say to anyone at all that may be struggling? I mean, let's look at the, the fact that you got books done. A lot of people want to do books. They have these dreams. Everyone's got a story in them. Everyone's got a book. How did you actually get yourself to a point where you could write a book? How did you focus yourself? What did you do to make that actual goal happen? I think it, well, it first started well, many years, many years ago um, when I happened to be on holiday. And as you do happen to, I saw this crystal ball gypsy and I thought, well, why not? So I went in and she told me everything um, that I already knew. So I said, well, that's incredible. But anyway, what about something I don't know? And she's eventually, she said, you'll write a book. And, the, and she told me exactly how it would happen. And she said, but watch the second book it will go to America and it'll be huge and also she gave me other bits of other information and I, I just so truly believe that I want to help to Tibet and, and the suffering that you know it's hard to imagine is going on that these people you know they can't even talk about the Dalai Lama or I mean it is horrendous but you know and I believe that this book um, if it could be made into a film to get the message out there um, of, of um, well, lots of things like, you know, reincarnation. And as you said, you know, people are scared of death. They're scared of pain. They're scared of illness, scared of loneliness. You know, and for those people is look as to who you are, the real, the real you. Have faith in yourself. Get help if you need it. And just know that you are so capable of so much more. Thank you, Alison. Um, you've been through so much yourself. Um, obviously, we haven't got time to discuss all the experiences you have. Thank God you're well. And, I'm and you. <laughs> you. I'm very well, thank God. And that you um, are on the path, you found your path through all of this suffering and trauma. And now you've gone out and you've created the life you love, but you've done it because you love humanity. And then that's what gets me up. That's what gets a lot of people up in the morning is this intense feeling like, oh, I've had a terrible day or I haven't slept or whatever. I'm still going to go out there. I'm still going to put my part into this tapestry or this jigsaw. Yeah. And another thing is as well is that we need to rest. A lot of people seem to forget that that we, you know, we work intense, we work intensely a lot, a lot of the time. And I think this is now also an opportunity to know that a lot is happening because of our work. We sent the ripples out and we're sending the ripples out, but we need to step back and take care of ourselves and self-nurture. And I presume that's in a lot of your work as well, is that you've got to self-nurture and you've got to learn the lessons yourself and then go out and teach them and everything is a gift people don't realize it that if you can i i can understand that you would say that your cancer was a gift in some way for you to be able to do the work and people that understand that are ready to accept everything to be able to say thank you you know to say i'm grateful for the gifts these gifts that were given to me that were not what i wanted the body or my, you know, the, con the ego didn't want it, the way we're brought up, the personalities, the identities yeah. didn't want it, but we needed it and everything is perfect. Everything is so synchronized and I expect that you can see that as well. It truly is and I think if people wake up, find their purpose, but you know, one of the things I do, like you're talking, you have to look after yourself, is I just make um, I, I, I'd absolutely do it's an 11 minute breathing exercise in the morning and it's amazing and then I go and have a cold shower 
and then I go on my walk, do my exercise, eat healthily. But I think it's also when you look out to, towards what's happening and just stop. Think about everything that's negative that, you, that you're thinking, that you're bringing in. You don't need it. Even making neg negative comments, judging people. We don't need to. We should be coming together and we should be standing up for our rights. Not, not fighting, not arguing with each other, joining. And I, I believe that this is an awakening. I believe there's a porthole that is opening and people can will, they'll be able to see it if they wake up. Because you, you are, as a person, entitled to be happy, to enjoy life. And you just need to stop the thinking. You're allowed to be free. <laughs> That's right. Say whatever you want to say as long as you're not in, inciting vi violence or to hurt anyone physically, you're, you're allowed to say what you feel and that's what we're going back to, I do believe it. And uh, so coming full circle, the crow and the talk about death, Just shall we just end with that maybe just a little message that may come to you in your intuition? What would how can we end this we could bring it full circle with um life death being a circle but it's all a circle and you go you come back you go you come back <laughs> you learn your lessons and yeah. you rest and i think we've got to a point now that those of us that are here reincarnated uh, this is the most glorious this is the time when we are going beyond all the veils, the apocalypse, but we are finding what held us back. There's always been these questions like myself, why can't I go out and do talks? Why will the media not let me talk about Simply Amazing, about my life, about recovery without medication? Blocked everywhere. But, and it's, it's like, okay, I get it now. I get everything now. I understand everything. And, and you, do you see what I mean? Yeah, I, there's the, the, not telling the story they want you to tell anymore. No, I think that the, there's a process of life, of between life, birth, and death. And we all know it's a fact we're going to die. So we have to accept that fact and make the most of our life because yeah, we've got a crack at it and we can do some amazing things when we look outwards and not just, you know, looking. And I know it can be very difficult. But you cannot feel fear if you haven't thought the thought. You can't, it's not possible. So it's, you know, and I go, away, I go back to being awake. While, while we're alive, be awake. Get to nature. Understand that everything in life has a frequency, a color, a vibration, and that you are more. And you can pick up on more telepathy, whatever you can pick up on people and develop that. Thank you so much, Alison. Uh, I think this is going to go on more than one show. <laughs> that would be lovely because I, I have to say I really like talking to you because I know you get it. That I think that's that's some that's lovely. I do, and uh, I, my life has been developing in extraordinary ways that I'm starting to see more and more the progression um, but it's been amazing talking to you about the taboo subject uh, yeah. of death which is something they do death cafes but i mean i have people saying to me i'm absolutely terrified of death and i can't deal with it so it needs to be talked about and i'm very grateful that this is you brought with um with the reincarnation so it's the end and the beginning things you know ending and starting mm -hmm. And coming full circle so it's been a pleasure and yes, thank you enjoy the beautiful what part of edinburgh are you in by the way um because i know uh, i know kirkaldi i know quite a lot of the areas around there yeah i'm out um where would i be i'm out sort of west but li literally about 10 minute 15 minutes from haymarket station so you probably oh. know Market station but going west so oh. but still in Edinburgh, but not in the heart of Edinburgh. Okay. 15 minutes from the centre, so it's lovely. 
one of the things again i keep saying we're going to end <laughs> and i just came into my mind was oxygen how important people don't realize um oxygen is as you said nature and uh the last time i went to edinburgh as i said i have a good really good friend in kirkcaldy beautiful area and the beach and i love um kinghorn it's one of my favorite oh, places beautiful yeah want to be want to be there i love it absolutely love it and um one of the things i did last time i was in edinburgh is i went to the ms center to have oxygen because when I was having continuous oxygen, you can go there and you can have it for pain or, you know, to detach. It, it was incredible. I mean, it detached me so quickly from my grief, the grief I had. And I, I, I didn't have one cold that year, not one cold. And this is exactly what you're saying. We have to be out in nature. We have to be God or love, the way I'd like to call it love is given us everything for a reason to stay well to have a good life and the way things have gone in the last few months with this lockdown those of us that never locked down <laughs> the, the whole time in nature and getting stronger and healthier are the ones that are wide awake now and we can see we can see what's happening you can see these like you writing a book they are writing stories for us to watch like a different story every couple of months <laughs> and then, you know, what's going to be the next one <laughs> yeah, what's, what's coming next <laughs> i'm hoping that people are going to be standing out there like we've had traumatic childhoods they're going to be standing out there with all the sex slaving and you know bringing back the innocence but i'm going to finish there because i'm diversifying now it's been wonderful. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you. There and uh, we'll go and find the book and contact you. And um, thank you so much for coming on so quickly. You know, when I did this in the past, it was so difficult for me to get people. And now I can get guests just like that. <laughs> Brad Yates on, boom, you know, she's yeah, yeah. tapping. Uh, there's a few people I'm trying to get on here. Apparently, Donald Trump. <laughs> I'd love that would be a joy. <laughs> I'd love to. But who knows if it's meant to be? It will be, and it just—it's some. You know, it's. I believe it. We just work in this amazing energy, and actually, we don't need to control it. We just need to be open to it, and we just need to put the thoughts out there. And I mean, I just—I pray, and and at the moment, I'm praying, praying this someone will make this book into a film i believe in that because i believe it for the right reasons mm. so you know it's, i've just been on this miracle journey with and, and i've we'll see what happens it's fantastic well if you need any actors or any music i'm there <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I need someone to come along you know we I need to get somehow to get to you know the, all these these famous people who are buddhists who are actors who would say I'm going to do this for the cause. I know how to put this together for for Tibet, and because I think that's the Dalai Lama said he's living another twenty years and he will return to Tibet, and I believe him. Mm. I mean, you've got a similar situation with the Falun Dafa as well. The one beautiful meditators that have been slaughtered for their organs, but. It's all coming up and we will get, you know, this is the platform for us to bring it all together, bring all your dreams together. That's right. We'll go out there and we make a better world with a new media. <laughs> Absolutely. It's Thank wonderful. Thank you so much, Alison. I hope we meet soon. So as Alison has done, you can go out and write your book. You've all got a book in you. You've all got an amazing story. And now it's your time to go out there and come from your passion and you've got a platform whoever you are even if you've written a few chapters you're welcome on here to give you the inspiration to carry on so thank you again alison it's been lovely and uh speak to you soon and really really have, have a beautiful life protect you yourself and go forward because um i believe that you are protected obviously <laughs> from what you've told us you are protected and you what you're doing is yet you have a journey and all of our journeys are, got, are fitting together at long last. 
they're all fitting together and there will be a space for every hum humanitarian cause it's all going to come together in one package in one voice absolutely and because there will be the new vibration that's coming in it's not going to be possible to have anything but love so anything that isn't love will will just disappear absolutely and the messages that need to come out as we are the messengers of light and that's what this program is called messages of light who do you think you are as well as the book show as i say it's probably going to go on both are here to give that message to do our work to give that message and then step back take away our past and our trauma and any beliefs well you obviously have have been going very much forwards with that so a lot has come off of you um and just see the magic unfold see the synchronicity happen yes, protect yourself with um a shield i do the violet flame protect uh, protection and and that's it we we do our work so take care lots of love and I'll, I'll be in touch soon yeah. thank, yeah. thank sure. you Alison. thank you bye-bye